Okay, wait. I'll just, I'll just read off all of your companies, Elon. I, I know them, but I'm just gonna read them to make sure I don't miss one, because there's so many now. Uh, founder, CEO, Chief Engineer of SpaceX. Uh, CEO, Product Architect, and Chairman of Tesla. Uh, owner, Chairman, CTO of uh, X, uh, of X.com. Uh, founder of Boring Company. Co-founder of Neuralink and OpenAI. And President of the Musk Foundation. Did I get everything? Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of absurd. Where are you at Starbase? Um, I'm in flight like, currently. So this is a, this is a Starlink in flight uh, connection. Are you kidding me? That's oh yeah, that works pretty well, huh? <laughs> I think there's only one. <laughs> Wait, I think it's one of one. Test of, of how Starlink works uh, at, in an airplane at altitude. There's only one of those in existence, right? It's on your plane. That's it. One on one. Uh, there are a number of airliners that uh, have uh, Starlink, and there will be a lot more in the future. Nice. Uh, the, the, the Starlink connection, when, you know, assuming it's working properly, is you wouldn't even be able to tell you you're on the ground or in the air. Because um, unlike the geosynchronous satellites, uh, the latency is, you know, really can be less than 20 milliseconds. So um, it's, it's a if you, in fact, for a lot of, I think for some people, the sonic connection on the plane will be better than their connection at their house. That would be pretty great. Um, how, how is um, the Starship doing? It was incredible to see the first uh, launch, but I understand you're closing in on the second. I know you've been working really hard on that, and the team's working hard on it. Um, what, when do you think you're going to get the next one up, and um, what are the chances it makes it to orbit? Uh, well, we have the second one stacked uh, at Starbase, so it's ready to go. Um, and uh, we just finished that up in the last week. Uh, we believe we've, we've completed the remaining um, items requested by the FAA, so we should get our license hopefully soon. Um, but re really, the only thing holding back uh, second flight of Starship at this point is the right for approval. Wow. Uh, um, what's your expectation uh, or your hope in terms of the probability that it gets to orbit? No, it's just a question of timing. Yeah. Uh, how long does it take to get the approval paperwork and whatnot? Um, so that's really up to the FAA at this point. Yeah. But but what about making it to orbit? Do you think oh, you got a shot this time? A, we are doing a new staging technique called hot staging, uh, where um, you light the upstage, uh, the upstage engines or the ship engines while the um, boost stage is still firing. And... Um, this is the, kind of, this is the most efficient way to do stage separation of a rocket going orbit. Um, but we did not try that on the last mission, and, and we're trying it on this mission. We think it will be overall better. Um, but I, I think this, I think probably have a, well, I hope, well over 50% chance of getting to stage separation. Um, and maybe a close to 50% chance of getting to orbit if the hot staging, um, the, the new separation method, uh, is it works. So I'd say maybe it's like a, you know, about, I'd say probably above 30% chance of getting to orbit this time, whereas previously I said below 50. Mm. Uh, is this, uh, in terms of complexity, how complex is this of a problem compared to the other problems you've worked on in your career? Uh, well, so, I mean, ma making a rocket that is more than twice the size of the Saturn V, um, you know, it's a, uh, in fact, with, with the next rev of the rocket, it'll have roughly three times the thrust of a Saturn V moon rocket. Um, moreover, it's designed to be fully and rapidly reusable, whereas the, you know, the Saturn V was completely expandable. And with Falcon 9, we, we still expand the upper stage, uh, but we, we bring back the boost stage, as people have probably seen the, the rocket landing videos, and we are also able to recover the variant. Um, with, the, with Falcon 9, but it, it, these things do land typically out to sea, so it takes a while to bring them back to port and get them ready for flight again. The, the, the thing that, you know, so, so there's the scale of Starship, but then also the fact that it is designed for full and rapid reusability, so that both the booster and the ship come back to the launch site. They get caught by these giant mechanical arms. You've seen Kong versus uh, Godzilla. Uh, it's basically that. 
uh, catches this giant rock out of, you know, mid air and puts it back on the launch stand and gets ready for launch. So it will be capable of, you know, basically aircraft level flight rates, um, but, but it's much bigger than, say, a 747 or an A380. Um, Elon, can we. Um talk about the events of, was it last weekend, the whole Ukraine Starlink thing? Can you give us like a, the TikTok of like what's going on and like how you're being forced to decide? <laughs> uh, but like, wh what is it like in that decision room, if there was one or wherever you were, where you're trying to figure out, am I keeping this on? Do I turn it off? What is going on? People must have been bombarding you. Could, whatever you can share about what that was like, how you made the decision. Um, yeah, I, I, so uh, I just was actually mistaken uh, a little bit in his understanding of the situation. Um, you know, obviously, we, we, SpaceX have provided uh, Starlink connectivity for, you know, to Ukraine um, really since the beginning of the war. Uh, we're really within, a, I think, a few days of the war starting. Um, and as the Ukrainian uh, government said, the uh, Starlink was, was instrumental in the defense of Ukraine. So, you know, they've said this really many times, although the media forgets to mention that. Um, so, and in fact, they've said it on Twitter, uh, it, it, you know, X, formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna take a while to get that right, yeah. It'll hey, take a little okay. time. Um, <laughs> 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 so, you know, you don't, have to, you don't have to take my word for it, you can just read what, what they posted. Um, you know, uh, so, uh, so Starlink has been incredibly helpful to the Ukraine War for effort. Um, we've kind of gone out of pocket uh, very significantly uh, to help them. Um, and um, but at, the, at the time this happened, the uh, region around U U uh, Crimea um, was actually turned off. Now, the reason it was turned off was <laughs> actually originally was because the United States has sanctions against Russia. Um, and we're not allowed to actually, and that includes Crimea in the sanctions, <laughs> and we're not allowed to actually turn on uh, connectivity to a sanctioned country without explicit government approval, um, which we did not have from the US government. So, um, so, so basically, the, uh, uh, you know, Ukraine didn't, they didn't give us any, any advance warning or heads up or anything. Um, but we just got the, the sort of, uh, urgent calls from the Ukrainian government saying that we needed to turn on Crimea. It's like in the middle of the night, basically. <laughs> and we're like, what are you talking about? You know, are we you lost? <laughs> What's it for? <laughs> um, you know, and, and then, you know, we, we basically um, figured out that this was kind of a, like a Pearl Harbor type attack on um, Sebastopol, on the Russian fleet in Sebastopol. So they're really asking us for, to, to really proactively take part in a major act of war. Um, and, um, you know, while we have, so, so certainly have huge empathy and support for the Ukrainian government, um, the Ukrainian government is not in charge of US uh, people or companies. Uh, that's not how it works. Yeah. And, and Elon, if, if I could just... And, 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 yeah. but, but I should say that you know, although I'm not uh, President Biden's biggest fan, if, if I had received a presidential directive to turn it on, I would have done so, because I do regard the president as the chief executive officer of the country, whether I want that person to be the, 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 the president or not, I still respect the office. And so, if, if you know, if, if, we've gotten a, if I've gotten a request from the president type of thing, from the American president, to be clear, yeah. um, <laughs> then, <laughs> then I, I would have turned it on, you know, so but no such request came through. That, that's a really, that's a really wow. interesting point. And um, you're, I mean, the, the what Jamal is referring to is you're now being attacked. I saw there was a, you know, there was Jake Tapper uh, the other day on CNN interviewing our Secretary of State was just, he was all lathered up, basically attacking you for this. Uh, David, yeah. David. I mean, I mean, I mean it's, 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 to his credit, uh, Secretary Blinken was actually quite supportive yeah. Despite the absurd, uh, you know, accusations and leading questions of, uh, of Jake Tapper on CNN. Yeah, um, he didn't take the bait, so, to his credit. You know, Secretary Blinken, in this regard, uh, for not um, 
you know, taking the bait at all. Yeah. Well, I, to me, this is an example of no good deed goes unpunished. Because if you had never given... Well, um, I, hope so, I hope some good deeds <laughs> that go unpunished. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you if you had never given Starling, you just aspire to that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, my point is just if if you had never given Starling to the Ukrainian government for free, voluntarily, you just volunteered it, then no one would be attacking you right now for not turning it on so they could do their attack on Crimea. Yeah. Um, also, one other thing I'll note is that your reason for not turning it on, which is you don't be part of what could be a major escalation. Was exactly, yes. was exactly the reason the Biden administration did not give ATACMs, ATACM missiles, to Ukraine at that point in the war. Now, they may be changing their yeah. minds, but they were very worried about an attack, the administration was, an attack on Crimea triggering some huge escalation in this war. So not only did you not receive a directive from President Biden, your thinking was very much in line with theirs at the time, and, right, yet, exactly. and you're being attacked for that now. There, there's something you mentioned, which is that you did this at a lot of economic costs to SpaceX. Can you, just right. talk, can you just talk about that for a second? Because I'm not sure people understand who's paying for what right now and who hasn't been paid and, you know, et cetera. Et yeah. Cetera. Um, that is, um, well, as you said, like a lot of people contribute to the effort. Uh, Starlink is the fundamental communication backbone of the Ukrainian uh, government and, and essential services, like first responders and that kind of thing. Um, and, it, you know, is, is used, we, we poke peacefully, relatively peacefully, on the war front. It is the only thing that works on the war front. Everything else is being jammed by the Russians. So, it's the only thing that works. Not, not one of the things. Um, um, you know, but, but I think, you, you have to sort of think of, say, the, you know, the, um, you know, taking the actual example of Pearl Harbor and say, like, well, how did that work out for Japan? It didn't work out well at all. Right. Um, because it was a, a tactical victory, a strategic defeat. It enraged the American public, um, who, who, who sort of naturally wanted vengeance for, for the sack, you know, the sack. And I think that, that you know, while I don't think it's on the same scale, that there was certainly that potential of, of sort of a many Pearl Harbor with results in a mass es escalation of uh, hostilities. Um, but not, th this, would, this, would not, this would not defeat Russia, it would enrage Russia. Do you donate, obviously. do you donate the um, network or do they pay you for it? Sorry? Do oh, it's just, yeah. so um, I, I'm actually not sure what, what the final accounting is at, at this point, but uh, I, I, I think at, at one point, at one point uh, you calculated our, our sort of cost of supporting things that are roughly $100 million. Now, the $100 million is, does not count um, the massive risk to the entire Starlink constellation uh, because uh, Russia would like to have the entire thing deleted. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, no, nobody compensating us for that. Um, and uh, so if we were to get, say, uh, our control center were uh, take down in cyber attack, they, you know, they could command all the satellites to the orbit. Um, and destroy the entire system, uh, or use anti-satellite weapons. Um, so, you know, th these are, this is a pretty significant risk, um, for which we have not received any compensation, and obviously would be catastrophic to the entire stalling system, which is, you know, on, you know approaching $10 billion. Elon, do you think the current government administration- I don't think saying, hey, $10 million. Yeah. And, and then, actually, I'd say one of the, Rather vexing things was, as you as you've seen this, there's a very large amount of money that's been appropriated for uh, Ukraine. You know, I'm not sure what the t the total is at this point, but it must be a hundred close to hundred billion or somewhere between eighty and hundred billion. Um, you know, now all of the you know other sort of providers, the U.S. providers of support to Ukraine are being paid. So then, why should SpaceX be excluded? That doesn't make sense. We're, we're, we're doing one of the most valuable things, and yet are getting the least money. This is absurd. Um, but you know, despite that, we're still happy to keep keep it going. And um, Elon, does the Biden administration have it out for you, and why? <laughs> uh, why never gave you that idea? No. 
<laughs> but l let me ask, y you own and I, control... I, I, I think the whole administration has that, right? Right. But I think there's probably is aspects it, of the administration is it, that is are it? not, uh, or, or, you know, as aspects of, you know, interests aligned with, uh, with, with, with President Biden who probably do not um, wish good things for me. Um, I don't know, you know, really what their issue is, but th th there does seem to be um, a significant increase in the weaponization of government, um, and um, I, I say really sort of misuse of prosecutorial discretion in, in a many, many, many areas where, and I, and I think this is, this is really a dangerous thing for, um, you know, for, I don't know, for, for, for there to be partisan politics with, with, with government agencies. It's, it's just really, and then I think from, you know, from, from, from say, uh, uh, a, you know, a Democratic Party standpoint or, or say a Biden, Biden administration standpoint, I think this is, this is the, the danger here is that if there's a significant um, misuse of prosecutorial discretion. Let's say one says, okay, everyone's equal under the law. Yes, but who are you, who are you choosing to pursue? Um, and if, you, if, you, if you're pursuing what, what appear to independent voters to be uh, trivial cases while ignoring serious crimes, um, it's hard to imagine that a lot of independent voters, uh, that's gonna win over thoughtful mm -hmm. independent voters. Did, this, did things change when you bought Twitter? X. Yeah, I think they did, they did change somewhat. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go with the uh, with with the sort of you know the, new, the X platform is really to be uh, a level playing field, a public square that is supportive of um, you know most of the country. Let's say that the middle eighty percent or something like that. Um, now. Um, that's not been the case, really, for all social media. That so all social media have been really very, le very le left leading, to far left leading, and really Twitter was far left leading. Um, you know, the, the, the suspensions of of um, say Republican candidates or interests or voices was, was uh, really at least ten times the rate of, of, of um, suppression of left left wing voices on you know on F on old Twitter. Um, so, so you know, it, what we're trying to do is move it to the middle, which from the standpoint of, say, the left, appears, it, it is moving to the right. <laughs> Everything's relative, <laughs> if you're standing on the left. <laughs> but it's not, it's simply moving to the middle, <laughs> that's all, um, in an attempt to actually represent the whole country um, and, and not just, um, you know, half the country or even maybe less than half the country. So. That's it, really. So I, don't, I think there's a, like there's really nothing to be alarmed about here. It's and, you know it's just that it, it's it's it intended to be a town square, inclusive of the whole country and also you know and and the world. That's all. It, it's been. Um, I guess you took over um, X Twitter on Halloween weekend, if I remember correctly, uh, when you got to the building and you got the keys. Um, and David and I were yeah. lucky to be there with you when you got the keys, and we got to. Um, check things out. Um, this is 10 months into the turnaround, uh, and it wasn't a high-functioning organization, I think, when you took it over. W where is the company at now, and are you pleased with, I guess, the progress? Because it looks like new features are getting launched, the product velocity is great, uh, obviously yeah. advertising's been challenging, but it feels like there's some green shoots. So, so how do you feel about the purchase now? Yeah, well, I, I should say we've recently seen a significant uh, increase in advertising, which is great. Um, so that's a, you know, if, if that trend continues, um, I think the company will be in, in very good financial shape on the advertising front. Um, so that, in terms of positive developments, that that seems to be one of them. Um, and um, for, from a feature standpoint, I think that those who are look, using the system, I think we've. I think we might have looked a little bit more new features, you know, in the last, I don't know, year than in the last, you know, all, all Twitter did in five years. You know, there's, there's really, the feature, the feature development pace is very rapid. Um, and this has been done with, 
probably about 15% of the original company. Um, maybe a little more, 15 to 20%. Um, so it's it's really, you know, efficient. Uh, you, know, at the, you know, at the end of the day, you have to say, you know, how complicated is a system uh, like the X Twitter platform? Um, you know, it, it, how different is it from a group chat, frankly? It's like a group chat at scale. Um, so he, I don't think you need an army to maintain a group chat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's not the self-driving platform, and it had maybe 10 times as many people working on it as the self-driving platform at Tesla, which Correct. seems crazy. It, the entire self-driving AI software team is 200 people. And uh, what they're doing is much more complex than Twitter. Yeah. Or, you know, much more, <laughs> a lot more. <laughs> yeah. So, well, um, you, know, you know, there's other things that obviously need to be done, like uh, advertising sales, um, obviously network operations, and... Um, How? Can you talk you know, to us about I mean, no, it's really not, it's not a, it's not a huge... I, I don't, like I said, don't even know me for, for, for what we're doing here. And I think, you know, the people that, that are um, still at the company are obviously being very productive in uh, creating and delivering new features. Um, and, um, you know, we, we keep seeing sort of record, record usage. And, and I, the, the, you know, the most rigorous number is really the is user seconds as reported by the mobile device, especially iOS. The, I, the, you know, the iOS, uh, uh, what, what iOS reports as the screen time is the, is, is the least gameable metric. Um, and, the, and those numbers are, extremely, are, are very good. Um, so, you know, I think, of course, the optimistic about where things are headed, and I, I, I feel like the company's turned just you know just recently turned turned a corner. Um, Tell us and, about you know it's had well, um, at least moderate prosperity and, and hopefully significant. Tell us about um, the success of sharing revenue. Why did you do it? And then just the the vision you have for just the creator economy and what you want that to evolve into and build into. Yeah, I mean, it sounds the reason that if, if you're a creator and you, know, you need to um, you need to make a living for what you're doing. Um, so there's got to be um, you know fair compensation, competitive compensation for a creator, whether they're doing you know write their writing or pictures, video, whatever the case may be, um, and uh, so we're not, we're not so we're not really you know advancing anything new here. We're just you know as YouTube does with creators, they will sh do rev share um, with advertising, and so we're doing rev share with advertising. Um, we're also you know obviously have enabled direct subscription to uh, accounts where whatever that somebody you know you, you could be doing audio, video, long form text, anything, and you could subscribe to someone and. Um, that's you know obviously that's the way for a subscriber to make a living as well, as well you know or, or for a creator to make a living. So the, the, the intent is for the X platform to be the, the best home for creators, uh, where if you've got interesting content, then you you want to put it on our platform. And um, you know I, there, there's a lot of questions about like sort of the algorithm and whatnot. I I, I should mention like the the algorithm is uh, I think almost all of it is open sourced and and we will. Uh, I think quite soon have the entire thing open source. Uh, the only reason I, it, it really hasn't been done entirely open source yet is because we're somewhat embarrassed with the code and need to just clean it up before uh, putting something extremely embarrassing out there. But the point is that like, we, we want uh, tr transparency builds trust and if you've got, um, uh, if, if, you, if you can recreate the results um, on the X platform of, of how viral a post is gonna be, Independently, using the uh, you know the, the, the public algorithm, of, you know the open source algorithm, um, that that's really where, where we want to get to. Um, so you, you kind of you kind of know what to expect um, and, and why something happened. Um, now, now I should say that the we are we are trying to optimize for uh, user time um, on the platform. What this naturally means is that. Um, posting content that someone looks at longer is going to get higher priority than content that is short. Uh, just because the system is trying to 
max, it, uh, it's, 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 it's aspiring to maximize uh, you, uh, unregretted user minutes, is what I call it. So like basically, how do we, um, if, if, if we're succeeding, you want to spend more time on the platform, and you want to, and, and, and after having spent that time, you don't want to regret it. Uh, I mean, speaking of TikTok, um, you, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people tell me they spent a lot of time on TikTok and they regret it. Um, we don't want to be, we want you, it to be that you spend a lot of time on the X platform and you learned a lot, uh, you, you're entertained, and you don't regret it. So when you're optimizing for you know, user minutes, and like I said, aspirationally unregretted user minutes, uh, uh, the, the, if you post, the more content that you post on the system, the more reach that uh, thing will get, because the system is saying, oh, there's, the user is spending more time on the platform because they're, they're you know, seeing, say, your podcast or uh, reading um, a long form article or, or watching some video, um, th that's going to get a lot more time than, say, if you, if you link to a video elsewhere or you link to an article elsewhere. That, that, that's just, that, that, yeah, that, that means you'll see people be on that post for a very short period of time. And so the, the system will be like, okay, that did not increase uh, user time. So it, it, will, it won't be excluded, but it will, it, it will get less attention. That than actually posting content natively on the system. Do you want to talk um, about uh, the ADL and you uh, sort of where what the status of that is, whether you're pursuing a lawsuit or not, or where that stands? Um, I think we'll have to see about that. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, the fact of the matter is that uh, ADL did initiate a boycott. They don't call it a boycott; they call it a pause. But you know, pause that is never ending. Is boycott. <laughs> yeah. So, it's the same thing. Um, so and 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 we just we saw a massive drop in uh, U.S. advertising. We saw basically no change in, in advertising in Asia, but domestically with ADL is strong. We saw a uh, sixty percent drop in advertising. So you know that's uh, pretty intense. Um, and. Um, and this is despite you know showing repeated uh, uh, analyses of the system, including third-party analysis of the system, which actually showed that uh, the number of uh, views of hateful content uh, declined. So, you know, the third parties who have all the data analyzed and said actually there's less hate speech. Um, the, the, the issue I think with, with the ADL is not a question of hate speech. It's not a question of anti-Semitism, obviously. Uh, it's that the ADL um, and a lot of other organizations have become activist organizations uh, which are acting far beyond their uh, stated mandate or their original mandate. And, and I think far beyond what donors to those organizations think they are doing. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that the ADL was, was extremely opposed to, and in fact was instrumental in in happening was there, the ADL was instrumental in getting um, Donald Trump the platform, um, and then when we, we, we you know, we restored the account, um, they, they, they made it super clear that they regarded simply restoring his account on, you know, Twitter now X, uh, that 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 constituted hateful speech. Well, he hasn't even said anything, you know. Um, he has to at least say something or post something. For there to be incremental, hateful, hateful content. This is absurd. Um, and what's this got to do with anti-Semitism? Like, you know, Donald Trump's son-in-law is Jewish. His Jewish grandkids. I'm pretty sure he's not anti-Semitic. Okay. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he's at the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, this, this, so, so, so uh, the problem is that a lot of these um, organizations, like I said, have, they've really been captured by the woke agenda, and they're they're pushing. Um, you know, a series of beliefs and values that I think are often uh, contrary to their, what, what their donors believe. Hey, and you know, that's, uh, that's what we have in this situation. Well, um, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll note that the, the two positions that you've taken that have brought the most heat on you, number one, defending free speech, number two, advocating peace. And <laughs> How really, dare you, Elon and, Musk? Yeah, how dare you? How dare you? And there's... There's an article. I feel like I'm in the opposite world or something. <laughs> yeah, you know? we're living in an upside down world. world. There's there's an article in today's New Yorker calling you a supervillain 
because you're advocating peace and protecting the First Amendment. I mean, it's like completely upside down. <laughs> Do you want people to eat their vegetables? <laughs> you know, at, at, at this point, you literally cannot tell actual press from parody. No. It's, it's, it's like... If that was a Babylon Bee or Onion, <laughs> no, literally, you, you're, you're doing a, you're doing a, and, and, and change the banner to, you know, Babylon Bee or whatever, Onion or something like that, mm -hmm. have some parody thing, right. and be like, oh, oh, that's a good joke, you know. So, um, <laughs> yeah, Super Bones normally advocate for peace. That's, you know, of course. Um, <laughs> we want to get rid of all the nuclear weapons. <laughs> hey, um, uh, you want, so hold on, hold on. Okay. There was a there was longer, so, uh, yeah, that's uh, a yeah. what? <laughs> the funniest, the, the funniest skit that didn't make it on SNL that we were workshopping was probably woke James Bond, and <laughs> we wanted to do like this woke James Bond, and Elon will tell you some of the jokes. It was pretty hilarious, but then we were just talking about a story that broke in the Guardian about the new James Bond novel and short story is too woke, and it's literally. The parody we did two years ago. Uh, <laughs> Elon, speaking of yeah. peace, we had I mean, we had a Graham, the, Graham the Allison. The reality, uh, and, and also like the you know the uh, you know conspiracy theories that 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 haven't come true list is you know quite short. Conspiracies that didn't turn out to be true is quite short. Um, and we really need more conspiracies generated because we're running out of... To find the truth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> it should be that Menchenkov is accurate. Um, so, uh, I don't know who's uh, you know, responsible for these sorry, conspiracy theories, but, but if, you know, we, we just need some more material. Yeah. Paging <laughs> Alex Jones. <laughs> yeah. Elon, we had Graham Allison here today. I know you talked about his book. We had Ray Dalio here. We had Ro Khanna, um, and we talked a lot about China, the U.S. relationship with China. You, are, you have several businesses that have deep supplier and customer relationships uh, in China. Given what's going on, and clearly the tenor has changed, the, the mood has changed with respect to U.S. policy towards China, what it's like in D.C., what it's like in Silicon Valley, and how everyone talks about the relationship with China today. It's pretty crazy how quick things have changed. Um, as a business leader with all these business relationships with China, how do you make decisions and, and how things are changing and how do you think about where this is headed? Sure. Well, I mean, let's just clarify here. Um, you know, SpaceX has no, uh, SpaceX and Starlink have no in China whatsoever. Uh, we're, they're, not, we're, they're not allowed to be, uh, you know, SpaceX does not launch uh, China satellites and Starlink is uh, banned in China. So. To so be clear, SpaceX, Starlink, zero business in China. Um, uh, in the case of, of Tesla, uh, one of our, well, of our four vehicle factories, uh, one is in uh, China. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a significant uh, car market, uh, but it is, uh, you know, so it, it, what I'm trying to say is like the, by far the bulk of, of my business interests, if, if I, I were purely mercantile, which I aspire not to be, um, are outside of China. Let's just be clear about that. Um, then, with respect to... Now, that said, I, I think I understand China well. I've been there many times. I've met with uh, the senior leadership um, uh, at many levels of China for, for many years. And so, I, I think I've got a pretty good understanding, of, um, at least a, as an outsider of China. So, and it, and T Tesla has been very successful domestically in China. So, um, you know, the, the fundamental thing here is is really Taiwan. Um, the uh, China has, well, really since uh, for, for like half a century or so, uh, maybe longer at this point, or just longer at this point, their the, the, their policy has been to to um, sort of re reunite Taiwan with China. Uh, from this standpoint, you know, it may be as analogous to like Hawaii or or something like that, like an integral part of China that is arbitrarily not part of China, um, mostly because of the, the U.S. Uh, stopped, has, the U.S. Pacific fleet has stopped uh, any, any sort of um, reunification effort force. Um, so now, really, things getting to the point um, increasingly year over year, uh, where China's military strength is increasing, and ours is more or less uh, static. 
And strategically, you know, you can imagine trying to defend Taiwan. It's not, not easy because uh, it's, it's very close to the coast of China. Um, so there will come a point, if, you know, pro probably not in the not too distant future where China's military strength in that region far exceeds U.S. military strength in that region. And if one is to take uh, China's policy literally, and probably one should, um, then there will be some forceful, uh, for force will be used for, you know, uh, to incorporate Taiwan into China. This is what they've said, um, that if, if there is not a diplomatic solution, there will be a solution by force. Let me, um, uh, if I can. And so really what's going on here, and you're seeing, you know, this in, in many areas, and I think this tempo is going to increase, is that, you know, both China and the U.S. are preparing for a potential showdown, uh, you know, in the South China Sea. So um, that's why you're seeing increasing restrictions on export of U.S. technology to China, uh, such as the, the NVIDIA's, uh, you know, the NVIDIA H100's being banned, you're not allowed to ship them to China. Um, and I think there'll be more and more, you, you, you also know that not allowed to ship, uh, advanced chip making equipment to China. Um, so, and I suspect, you know, you know China's gonna respond with some reciprocal sanctions. Um, and you'll, I think you'll see this kind of a tit for tat, uh, reciprocal sanctions uh, increasing in the next, next few years. So I think quite a very uh, hot temperature. Um, and then we'll see this, is there gonna be a diplomatic solution to uh, re your reunification or a non-diplomatic solution. You, uh, but you, it has made it clear that there will one way or another be a solution <laughs> from this standpoint. Yeah. You mentioned uh, NVIDIA, so let me just talk about AI and bring it back to that for a second. Can you tell us um, your regrets, but also the positives of the experience you had with OpenAI and then what your goals are with uh, XAI? Well, the AI discussion is, is certainly a long one, or could be a long one. Um, you know, uh, digital superintelligence, that might be the most significant technology that humanity ever creates. Um, and, and it has the potential to be more dangerous than um, nu nuclear weapons. So, um, You know, in the case of creating open AI, it was to have there not be a unipolar world where um, Google, with its subsidiary DeepMind, uh, you know, would control an overwhelming amount of AI talent and compute and, and resources, uh, which then is somewhat dependent on basically how, La La how Larry Page uh, and, and Sergey Brin um, and Eric Schmidt believe things should go, because they, they between the three of them, or two, two out of three have control over uh, Alphabet, because they've got super voting rights. And, um, you know, I was quite concerned based on some conversations I had with Larry Page, uh, where, um, you know, he did call me a specious for being <laughs> pro-humanity. And um, so I'm like, what side are you on, Larry? You know, uh, not ours, we would say. Um, you know, I think, and uh, so, so you know, I felt like uncomfortable um, having the entire future of digital superintelligence be in the hands of someone who called me a species uh, for being pro-humanity. Um, you know, how can it not be? Uh, so, that's the opening I was originally created as an open source nonprofit, and now is a closed form, it appears to be, it should be renamed closed for maximum profit AI. Um, <laughs> It is, it is closed, um, and they are aiming to, I think, make, try to make $100 billion, I think, according to Sam Altman, uh, get $100 billion from somewhere for some vast amount of compute uh, to create digital God. Um, apparently, all the, the waste is stored in a common separated value file, by the way, so our digital God will be a CSV file. <laughs> <laughs> How do we import it? <laughs> file? Yeah, import, God. Excel, yeah. um, see what happens. 
Um, so, so now, anyway, the, so, so now uh, o OpenAI is somewhat, uh, it's also very closely aligned with Microsoft. You know, Microsoft is really, you know, um, the OpenAI servers are running on in, in Azure and Microsoft data centers. You know, my, so really what you have is, I think at the end of the day, Microsoft having more control than OpenAI. Uh, they have access to all the source code, they have access to all the weights of the um, you know, GPT-4 and future versions. So they have all rights to this to, to thing. It's not, um, at, at any point really they can cut off OpenAI. I, I don't think OpenAI quite realizes that the dependence on, on Microsoft, and even if Microsoft does break some contract, they'll just be tied up in litigation for, you know, for years. Um, so really you've got a contest between kind of like Google and Microsoft. Google, as I mentioned, I'm concerned about, you know, uh, Larry not, not caring enough about AI safety and um, good reason. And then Microsoft just is, is a, I think, you know, a, a profit seeking organization. Um, and I, I, you know, I think such is great, but um, I, I can't say like, you know, that it would be difficult to, to say that, that Microsoft has a has an amazing track record in moral decision making. <laughs> so uh, diplomatic. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so so the, the, uh, so I was like, okay, look, let's just so it's, I think let's try to create a third company that is competitive. I I do, I do think Tesla is underrated from an AI standpoint in terms of real world AI. Tesla has the best Same. real real world AI. So. Uh, you know, hopefully between uh, XAI and uh, Tesla, there's kind of a third contender for well, visual super. Well, would you look? You've done. Uh, you open source your patents at Tesla. You yeah. are very pro open source your source code at X. Would you ever considering releasing Dojo and FSD more as a platform substrate for everybody else, or that's sort of off the table right now? Well, I don't know that. Uh, you know, in the case of, of say Dojo or our or inference hardware that's in the car, our boots inference computer, which is actually a lot, lot more computer than Dojo, by the way. Um, you know, we, we've got I don't know, somewhere in the order of four million cars that have um, high-speed AI inference computers in them. Um, you know, like open sourcing chip designs doesn't mean you you suddenly get that thing. Yeah. You know, uh, so. Um, you can open source the software, but I think chip designs, it's, they'll, they'll need one thing to actually use those chips or really kind of, yeah, it would, would be some someone that's willing to spend many billions of dollars on, um, on a computer development. So anyway, I think, I think in the case of, uh, you know, Dojo is interesting. Optimist is really interesting. Um, you know, I think just in general, Tesla is uh, one of the world's leading AI companies, uh, and in some respects, the leading AI company when it comes to real real world AI, understanding the real world and, and actually reacting to that with self driving. Um, and so, and I think that will become part of the, the solution for AGI or general super intelligence. So, um, uh, in the case of te Tesla, I think we've got a sort of a, a good governance structure and that there's no super voting rights or anything like that. So if I'm, you know, go crazy, the shareholders of Tesla can vote me out. Um, you know, I have a, a, enough of a vote to be, you know, I think moderately influential, but not enough to stay in even if I'm doing crazy stuff. So I think that's actually good. Um, Um, I'm told we have to yeah. wrap him. Oh, okay. Uh, I just on the FSD before we wrap, I'll let you go. Um, we were talking earlier this year, and you said, uh, "Hey, maybe ChatGPT 4.0 like moment for self-driving was coming." And uh, I've I've been playing with the beta, and um, yeah, how how close does it feel to you? Because it it some of the rides it's been doing for me are pretty darn impressive. The latest uh, beta is pretty incredible. Yeah, it's pretty pretty neat. I, you know, I used yeah. to love it on the highways and on the streets. I'd be like, okay, 
but now I'm using it increasingly on the streets. So where do you, how do you feel about it right now? And I, I guess you made a lot of predictions on it over the years, um, but it, it does feel like it's getting pretty close. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's very close to, uh, you know, being in a situation where even if there's no human oversight or intervention, that the probability of uh, a safe journey is, is higher with FSD and no supervision, like even if you're asleep in the car, than if the person is driving. Um, we were very close to that. Uh, you know, those that have the uh, FSD beta, which really anyone could get at this point. Um, so we're, we're the, the, my, the, the miles we see driven under the FSD beta currently are uh, much safer than the miles that are driven without it. Hmm. So um, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's already a, a very good milestone. Um, but, but you know, if you, you can just see that it's getting better and better. Like, um, if you see, if you compare the uh, you know FSD beta today versus six months ago versus not, you know a year ago versus eighteen months ago, it's really the improvement is dramatic. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, we've got the final piece of the puzzle, which is to have the control part of the car uh, transition from about three hundred thousand lines of C plus plus code to uh, also a neural network. So, the you know the whole system will be neural net uh, neural network um, photons in to controls out, and and, and that, that that's kind of the final piece of the puzzle for full self driving being significantly better than human. Wow, awesome! Uh, thanks for taking the time, buddy. Uh, fly safe, and I'll see you shortly, uh, ladies you. and gentlemen. Elon Musk. Thanks, bud. Be. Be. What? <laughs> we need to get merch. Oh,